The first long talk is by Noam Brown. Uh, the title of the talk is Safe and Nested Subgame Solving for Imperfect Information Games. And it's my honor to say that this talk has been awarded the, one of the best paper awards at the conference. So please join me in congratulating Noam and his co-author, Tomas Santom. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Noam Brown. This is joint with my advisor, Tomas Santholm, and I'm going to talk about our paper, Safe and Nested Subgame Solving for Imperfect Information Games. Now, this paper focuses on imperfect information games. These are not games like chess or Go, but rather games like poker, or more generally, any strategic interaction that involves hidden information. Uh, and I see this line of research as being particularly relevant to bringing AI into the real world, because most real-world strategic interactions involve some amount of hidden information. Now, when it comes to these games, Poker has served as the primary benchmark challenge for a long time, and in particular, a variant of poker called Heads Up No Limit Texas Hold'em. No Limit Texas Hold'em because it's the most popular variant of poker in the world, and it's a huge game at 10 to the 161 decision points. And Heads Up because when you only have two players, you can determine with scientific certainty who's better. You don't have to worry about issues like collusion or kingmaker effects that might interfere. And although AI has made a lot of progress in dealing with perfect information games, when it comes to imperfect information games, there has been limited success. And in fact, no prior AI has been able to beat top humans in this game. But earlier this year, our AI Labratus challenged four of the world's best heads up, no limit Texas Hold'em specialists in a 120,000 hand match that lasted 20 days. There is a $200,000 prize pool divided among the pros to incentivize them to play well. And the final result is that our AI won by a lot. Uh, this is about three times the win rate that you would expect uh, between a top pro and a, and a regular pro. It was statistically significant at about four standard deviations, and each human lost individually to the bot. And this came as a big surprise to everybody involved. It was a big surprise to the AI community, to the poker community, uh, even to us. And uh, I think what really demonstrates this is that if you look at the betting markets, there was a very active betting market leading up to this competition because they're poker players and they like to gamble. And uh, the betting odds against us were about four to one at the start of the competition. So when I talk to uh, people about this line of research, one of the questions I get a lot is, well, why are imperfect information games so hard? After all, we have Deep Blue, we have AlphaGo. Why, why can't we take those techniques and apply them out of the box to a game like poker? And there's a few reasons for this, but one of the main ones is that in an imperfect information game, the optimal strategy for a subgame cannot be determined from information in that subgame alone. Let me show you what I mean. In a perfect information game, if you take some action and your opponent takes some action and you find yourself in a subgame, you can forget about the sequence of actions that got you here, and you can forget about all the other situations that you did not encounter. The only thing that's relevant for determining the optimal strategy going forward is the state that you're in and all the states that can be reached from this point on. And in imperfect information games, this is not true. In imperfect information games, you take some action, your opponent takes some action, you find yourself in a particular subgame, but now some other subgame that you did not reach, and in fact you cannot even reach from this point on, can affect what the optimal strategy is in the subgame that you are in. And this is kind of a counterintuitive idea, but I'm going to give you a, a concrete example of it in a little bit. Now, when it comes to these games, what we're trying to do is find what's called the Nash Equilibrium. This is a profile of strategies, one for each player, where no player can improve by shifting to a different strategy. And in two-player zero-sum games in particular, this is extremely useful because if you're playing the Nash Equilibrium, you are guaranteed to not lose an expectation. And we're going to measure uh, our performance in terms of exploitability. This is distance, basically distance from a Nash Equilibrium. Now, you might wonder, why should we care about exploitability? And why should we care about Nash Equilibrium? And I think uh, if you look at recent uh, man-machine competitions, uh, it really highlights the importance of being robust uh, to, uh, to adaptation by the humans. For example, in the recent OpenAI competition in Dota 2, they managed to beat top humans in one versus one matches, uh, over about three matches. But once they opened up the AI to the public and invited the public to try it and, and beat the uh, AI, relatively weak players were able to figure out how to adapt to the, uh, to the bot and find weaknesses that they could take advantage of. And even with AlphaGo, in the original version of AlphaGo that beat Fan Hui, uh, they beat him 5-0, but uh, after several more matches, Fan Hui was able to find certain situations that the bot had a lot of trouble with, and they had to address these weaknesses before their least at all match. But in RAI Labratus, we played against top humans for 20 days straight, 120,000 hands of poker. And during that entire competition, all four humans were working as a team to try to explore and exploit the bot in any way they could find. And they couldn't find a weakness in the bot. 
And I think that the reason for that is our emphasis on being robust to opponent adaptation and exploitation and having theoretical guarantees on exploitability. Now, for the rest of this talk, I'm going I'm to introduce this game called Coin Toss. It's a toy game, uh, an imperfect information game, that's going to be used as a running example going forward. In this game, player one is going to flip a coin that's going to land heads or tails with 50-50 probability, and player two is going to try to guess the outcome of this coin toss. So uh, once the coin lands, player one is going to observe the outcome of this coin toss, and they have a choice. They can either sell the coin, or they can choose play. Now, sell is going to lead to a separate subgame, the details of which I'm not going to go into, but the expected value of that subgame is going to be important. If player one chooses play when the coin lands heads, they get an expected value of 0 0.5. We could say the coin is lucky, for example. And if the coin lands tails, we'll say the coin is unlucky, and they have to pay somebody 0.5, uh, 0.5 to take it away from them. So they get a reward of minus 0.5 by choosing sell. On the other hand, they could choose this action play. And if they choose play, then player two tries to guess the outcome of the coin toss without having observed how it landed. If player two guesses correctly, that is, they guess heads when the coin actually landed heads, then player one is going to lose $1, and player two is going to gain $1. And I'm showing the rewards here only for player one, because uh, player two is simply going to receive the opposite reward. On the other hand, if player, if player two guesses incorrectly, that is, player one, uh, if, that is, they guess tails when the coin actually landed heads, then player one is going to gain $1, and player two will lose $1. And you can see there's a dotted line between the two player two nodes. And this signifies that, they, that the two nodes are in what's called an information set. Since player two did not observe the outcome of the coin toss, they don't know which of these two states they're in. So I wanted to imagine that you're player two in this game, and you just observe player one choose this play action. So you know you're in this imperfect information subgame. Well, what should you do? What, what's the right uh, strategy? Well, one option is to just always guess heads. But if you do this, then player one can adapt by always choosing sell when the coin lands heads and getting 50 cents, and always choosing play when the coin lands tails and getting a dollar. So on average, player one is getting 75 cents. On the other hand, if you always guess tails, then player one could adapt by always choosing play when the coin lands heads, and always choosing sell when the coin lands tails, and averaging 25 cents in the game. So it turns out that the, uh, the optimal strategy is to mix. It's to guess heads with 25% probability and tails with 75% probability. Because if you do this, then no matter what player one does, they can't do better than an expected value of zero. So this is the Nash equilibrium strategy for player two in this game. But now let's say we change this game a little bit. Let's say we swap the payoffs for the sell action so that player one gets minus 0.5 for choosing sell when the coin lands heads and plus 0.5 for choosing sell when the coin lands tails. Well, it's easy to see that in this case, the, the strategy for player two in the, in the play slope game should actually change. We should be guessing heads with 75% probability and tails with 25% probability. But you can see what happened here is that by changing the expected value for the sell subgame, we have affected what the optimal strategy is in the play subgame. Even though the sell action is not in the, in the play subgame, and in fact is not even on the path to the play subgame. And this is, this is something that can only happen in imperfect information games. Perfect information games are a unique case where you don't have to worry about this problem. So when you're dealing with imperfect information, you always have to consider the, the entire game as a whole when you're deciding the optimal strategy for a particular situation. So we need very different techniques to address this. Now there is some hope. Uh, one of the nice things about this is we don't have to worry about the actual strategy in the, play, in the cell subgame. We only have to worry about the expected value for that action. And we can take advantage of this, uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, you might be wondering, well, why can't we just uh, estimate what the strategy that player one is playing? Why can't we just estimate that strategy and try to find a, a response to it? And this is a technique called unsafe subgame solving. Basically, the idea here is we're going to estimate a player one strategy, and then we'll uh, determine a much better strategy in the, player in the play subgame uh, that responds to that, that strategy. Uh, and I'll walk you through an example of this. You could say, like, after the coin lands, uh, we know that we're in one of these states with 50-50 probability each. And now when player one chooses play, well, we would have es we've estimated that player one would choose play with 80% probability when the coin landed heads, and 30% probability when the coin landed tails. So we're going to update our beliefs and say that now we're in a 73%, there's a 73% probability that we're in the left node, and a 27% probability that we're in the right node. And now we're going to determine an optimal strategy that responds to this belief distribution. But in that case, the optimal strategy would be to guess heads with 100% probability, and we've already established that that's a really bad strategy because player one could simply adapt by shifting to a different strategy. So you can't make assumptions about how the opponent is going to play, because they could always switch to a different strategy. Uh, in fact, unsafe subgame solving can lead to very high exploitability, both in theory and in practice. What we do instead is something called safe subgame solving. This has been an area of research that has uh, been developed over the past few years. 
Um, the idea here is that we're going to estimate the values the opponent receives in subgames. We're, we're not going to make any assumptions about how they actually play. So for example, we can estimate the value of the cell action for player one. And we have a theorem that says, if we are able to accurately estimate these values that the opponent, uh, the values of the actions the opponent could take, for example, if these estimates are off by at most delta, then we can guarantee that our strategy is at most two delta, explo uh, has exploitability at most two delta using safe subgame solving. And in fact, in some cases, we can actually do better than this. Um, for example, in this case, uh, player one receives an expected value of minus one for choosing cell, regardless of which state they're in. And obviously, there's no way to make player one indifferent between the cell and the play action in this case. The best we can do is uh, force them to get an expected value of zero for choosing play. But if we look at prior actions that the opponent could have taken, we, could, we might be able to do better than this. For example, maybe after the coin landed heads, there was some action that player one could have taken that would have led to a reward of $100. Well, if we find ourselves in the play subgame, then they would have had to have given up this expected value of $100 earlier on if they were in the, if they're in the head state. So, by reasoning about this, we can allow the value of player one to increase in the case of uh, the head state, and in the process, lower the value of player one in the tail state, and still be safe, still guarantee that they're not doing any better than before, and in fact, are actually doing worse in this case. So, reach subgame solving. Uh, guarantees that the uh, that we can do uh, just as well as past subgame solving techniques, safe subgame solving techniques, and in some cases can actually do better by looking at past actions the opponent might have taken. Now I'm glossing over a lot of the details because this is a short talk, but uh, the actual implementation of this is very difficult to do correctly. And in fact, two prior papers have tried to do something similar to this, but actually uh, did it in an incorrect way that allows exploitability to be very high in certain cases. Now there's another use of safe subgame solving, which is dealing with large action spaces. For example, let's say we're dealing with a, an auction, uh, an auction game, where uh, players can bid any amount between zero dollars and a thousand dollars. Well, dealing with a branching factor of a thousand is pretty is pretty difficult. But what we can do is reduce the complexity of the game by only considering, for example, bet increments of a hundred dollars. And the reasoning here is that there really isn't that big of a difference between bet, bidding two hundred dollars and two hundred one dollars. But now, if the opponent were to actually bid something like two hundred fifty dollars, then we have to round it to a nearby size. So for example, we would round $250 and treat it as if it were a bid of $200. But sub safe subgame solving gives us an alternative to this. Rather than rounding it to a nearby action, we can come up with a subgame in response to that action uniquely and solve it in real time. And we could try to make the opponent no better off for having chosen that action than one of the actions that are already in our abstraction. And actually, we have a theorem that says if the off-tree actions, that is, the actions that are not in our abstraction, are not much better than the actions that are already in our abstraction, then safe subgame solving will produce an approximate Nash equilibrium. And we can, re we can use this uh, repeatedly as we go down the game tree in response to subsequent off-tree actions in an algorithm called nested subgame solving. Here, we start with a very large game that's simply too large to solve up front. And we find an approximation for how to play in the entire game as a whole. This is called the blueprint strategy. And now, during actual play, if we find ourselves in one of these subgames, we we'll come up with a much better strategy in real time for that subgame, while fitting that strategy within the overarching blueprint that we've already computed. And we repeat this process as we go down the game tree. When we find ourselves in another subgame, we again find a much better strategy for that particular subgame, while fitting it within the overarching blueprint that we've already computed. Now, in terms of experiments, we find that these techniques lead to far lower exploitability. Uh, we are not the first paper to introduce safe subgame solving, but the techniques that we introduce uh, lead to a three times improvement over past safe subgame solving techniques. And nested subgame solving leads to 12 times less exploitability compared to action mapping techniques that I described earlier. And also in terms of head-to-head -head performance, these techniques lead to a dramatic improvement. Uh, there, is a, there is a competition called the Annual Computer Poker Competition, where researchers who work on imperfect information games get together, make an AI for poker, and play them against each other. Now, the previous best bot is called Baby Tartini Nate. This is our, our 2016 bot that won the competition. Uh, it beat the next closest competitor in the competition by 12 millibit blinds per hand. This is a measure of win rate in poker. And that, that bot was Slumbot. And it beat the 2014 champion by uh, 25 millibit blinds per hand. There was another AI called DeepStack that came out around the same time that also uses sub safe subgame solving and also has very low exploitability, but in terms of head to head performance, was not able to beat Baby Tartini Nate. But our AI Libratus, which uses nested subgame solving, is able to beat Baby Tartini in 8 by 63 millibit blinds per hand, which is a, a wide margin. And this is due largely to, to nested subgame solving. In fact, if you don't use nested subgame solving in Libratus, it's only about tied with Baby Tartini in 8. 
So to summarize, the contributions of this paper is that we developed domain-independent techniques for imperfect information games with provable guarantees on performance and exploitability. Uh, this is the first and only AI. This has led to the first and only AI to beat top humans in No Limit Poker. And we introduced new aspects to safe subgame solving that allow this achievement, such as considering previous actions that the opponent could have taken and uh, doing nested subgame solving, responding to off-tree actions. There are also techniques in the paper for being robust to errors in the model, which I don't have time to go into. And I think what really highlights this achievement is that if you look at the annual computer poker competition, between 2014 and 2017, none of the top teams used, used real-time subgame solving. But in 2018, which is uh, the 2018 competition, which is coming up in about two months, nearly every top team intends to use real-time subgame solving in their agent. So I'm going to stop there. I'd be happy to take questions. And just uh, one more thing. There's going to be a demonstration of Libratus tonight at 7 p.m. And one of the top poker players that we played against, Jason Les, will be there to demonstrate the bot as well. Thank you. So I think we don't have any time for questions, but maybe you can ask Noam questions at the demo tonight. 